Okay, we are. Shall I just dive into it, or do you want to say yes. anything first? <laughs> well, if you want, I can introduce you in Spanish for the yeah. audience to know who you are. A little bit. A little bit, ok. Bueno, muy bien. Bueno, bienvenidos a la primera charla de Laos. Sí, es de Laos 2021. Estamos con Shane, Shane Hasty. Es el, el director de programas de Easy Agile y nos va a hablar hoy de um, Product Ownership. ¿vale? Shane lleva desde 2019 como director de desarrollo en, en Easy Agile y lleva 30 años en el sector. Sí, como desarrollador, como líder de equipo, ¿vale? Y a, ayudando a los equipos a generar resultados. Uh, él está viviendo en Nueva Zelanda, ¿vale? Pero se dedica básicamente a la gestión de Easy Agile en todo, en todo, en todo el mundo. Ok, Shane, good to go. Gracias. Good day, folks. <laughs> thank you. Welcome and thank you for taking time out of your afternoon, evening to come to listen to me. It's uh, it's morning here in New Zealand and it's a crisp, clear, sunny day, but winter time. So the outside temperature is only six degrees, which is, I'm pretty sure, colder than what most of you are experiencing. Um, but product ownership, product ownership is a team sport, is the, the title of my, my talk and my uh, My hypothesis is that there are uh, some fundamental challenges with the way product ownership has been presented over the years and has been um, interpreted. And that's what I'd like to, to explore. So we've done a little bit of, a, of an intro, but yes, I'm with IC Agile. I also I could tell the world that my hobby is I'm the lead editor for all things culture and methods on InfoQ.com. I host the weekly InfoQ Engineering Culture podcast. I'm a father of five and a grandfather of seven. So um, yeah, grandchildren are a joy and a delight. And we use them to get revenge on our children. Everything that they did wrong, we encourage their children to do to them. And those of you who are parents, yes, we do it deliberately. <laughs> All right. The, so the structure, my intent here, the product owner role as a starting point. Um, then we'll look at project types and what's the impact on those. And then I want to talk about my hypothesis that the product ownership is a team activity and then a little bit about value versus velocity and then we'll wrap things up so i think we're going to go about 45 50 minutes with uh, and and um, we'll have a couple of points where we'll put people in breakout rooms or have some interaction and i want this to be an interactive and hopefully engaging conversation. So here is, and I haven't updated it for the latest Scrum Guide, but here is the, the Scrum, Scrum Guide definition of the product owner. The product owner is responsible for maximizing the value of the product and the work of the development team. How this is done may vary widely across organizations, Scrum's teams and individuals. The product owner is the sole person responsible for managing the product backlog. Now, if we look at that boundary of that's the primary responsibility of the product owner is to manage the product backlog. The Scrum Guide very deliberately says that there are many, many ways to do this. The co most common interpretation that I have seen for doing this has been the product owner as quote unquote, the single ringable neck. The person who is expected to understand every aspect of all the different customers, the technology potentials and limitations, the different competing perspectives of the organization and the different stakeholders, the, the one who's got to write all the user stories, 
the one who's got to um, do whatever analysis might be required. And then they throw these things at the team. This, for anything except a trivial product, is too much for a single person. And this has resulted in a, a large number of reasonably common anti-patterns of product ownership, common dysfunctions in product ownership. So what I'd like you to explore and Guillaume, we could do this um, just on the on the chat window, or okay, actually, or we can I can stop sharing, and we can we're a small enough group. There's only twenty eight people. We can ask people turn your cameras on, and talk to us, and please talk in Spanish. <laughs> I will trust Guillaume to uh, to explore. Cámara, okay, okay. Os ha pedido si queréis hablar, sí, si, poneros la cámara para contestar la pregunta que tenía en el chat, que podéis contestarlo en el chat si queréis. ¿eh? Si habéis visto antipatrones, si habéis visto partes donde el rol del Product Owner queda completamente sí, sobrepasado. Si queréis, podéis hablar directamente, habilitaros el micro o podéis contestarnos, sí, podéis contestarnos por el chat, cualquiera de las dos cosas. Puede ser en español. Sí, sí, totalmente. Y luego se lo, se lo traduciremos. Sí, sí. Eh, bueno, en mi caso tengo un, acabo de arrancar un proyecto de un Scrum. Vale. Y el Product Owner, el problema es que no le dedica el tiempo que necesitamos. Y, por ejemplo, en el planning ni siquiera estuvo el tiempo completo. O sea, nos dejó un backlog eh, a medias. Y el planning se retrasó a dos días. Vale. 16 horas porque no teníamos el apoyo del Product Owner y había cosas que había que... Eh, consultarle y no estaba disponible. Entonces yo creo que eso es algo bastante grave. Ok, vale, se lo digo a Shane. Shane, the first uh, comment. The product owner was not available full time. The product owner just delayed the sprint planning because he was not available and the team didn't have any support at all from the product owner. Yeah. And then we have another one in the chat saying, I just left an experience. Uh, the product owner was the Scrum Master and the product owner at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the absent product owner, the, 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 pro, the dual role, oh, that is hard. Hard on the team. How, do the, how does the, the product owner make the, or that person, because the, the Scrum describes those two roles just differently for very important reasons, because they have different fundamental um, success criteria. The product owner is about maximizing value. The, the, the Scrum master is maximizing value while maintaining team health. And that is, there's a tension there. Now, and the absent product owner is all too often. We, ju we just hope that the, that the team figures it out. Yeah. Any others? There's one already in English in the chat. I see cases when the product owner takes the role of a boss that basically yep. only delegates tasks. Yep, yep. I used to be a project manager. Now I'm a product owner. Do as I tell you. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm just new in this world of, of the Scrum and, and Agile frameworks and everything. And uh, my question is, is how and why does this happen? Because um, if, you don't, if you have your role uh, you know, defined and you are the product owner or you are the Scrum master, how, how the hell does this happen? And, and how do you acquire or, or, or get, uh, like, impose another, another role and knowing the consequences that this will get, uh, that, that, that this will get, that, that this will affect the team and the, and the final product and the timelines and everything. 
How does this happen or why does it happen? I have a hypothesis that for many organizations, when they adopt an agile way of working, they don't really. They adopt agile terminology and try and push the that on top of not changing anything in terms of the organization culture, the hierarchies, the command and control structures and so forth. And I see this very frequently. So we adopt Agile because somebody senior in the organization has read an HBR, interview, uh, an HBR article that says the whole world should be Agile today. Or a large consulting firm says you should have squads and tribes. And we bring this in, but we, we do this push down, top down agile implementation, which is not mindset philosophy culture based. If we look at the fundamentals of, of agile, it actually sits on a set of values and principles, the first of which is the individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Most implementations are processes and tools over people. And we then see the, we don't give people enough training and we don't give them the support to actually make that transition shift. That, that's the hypothesis that, that I put out there. And this is the most common, in my mind, the most common cause of these dysfunctions. I'm happy to be proven wrong. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, another one in there. The product mm -hmm. owner is not empowered and doesn't understand the thing, the things the team is working on. Yeah. Yes, the product owner needs or should have a, a deep understanding. So thank you for those. Come back to my, my presentation. One of the, the things, and this does go right back to the, the very beginning, the very foundation of Agile. In, in 2001, when the authors of the manifesto got together, the domain space that they were largely working in was the small team environment. There were, um, there was some stuff happening and Alistair Coburn's work on crystal methods was one that looked a lot at, okay, what is the, the specific context? And, but most organizations that adopt Agile today, and I am gonna say most, do start with this, let's find a one size fits all cookie cutter methodology and we know that there is no no one size fits all the work that we do today is different every organization is different the the complexity of the problem the complexity of the solution space the sometimes we're doing enhancements sometimes we're building on existing products sometimes we're building something from scratch Sometimes it's a, a burning platform and we have to uh, do something completely different. Other times it's small business process change. It's in response to customer needs. It's because we've identified a shortcoming and we have to be able to tailor, to adapt our approach. And again, one of the most common mistakes is let's adopt a framework, impose it on all of the teams and go even further and make those teams estimate in the same story points, for instance. But they're doing completely different types of work, but also all too often. And when we, when we think about the, what we call the Cinderella project, Janita Andrea, defined this all the way back in 2005. What is the Cinderella project for 
agile, out of the box. And it's the small co-located team with generic skills. We've got an expert engaged customer. We've got absolutely clear terms of reference. We're, we're in a short duration. It's web-based user-centric type products. We've got the access to subject matter expertise. We know why we're doing it. And our team members are dedicated to this project. Using the reactions button, how many of you are working in a project like this? If you can, if you can put a thumbs up on the reactions button, how many people are, you, are working in a project that is that focused and contained? Okay. Sí. Uh, Shane os pide que uséis las reacciones de Zoom que están abajo en la toolbar para sobre todo centraros si habéis estado en este proyecto, en, en este estilo de proyecto sin darela, eh, si se encienda, ¿vale? En un equipo pequeño colocado, con skills, digamos, genéricas, en menos de 12 meses, centrado en el usuario, sí, con expertos en la materia y con una visión de proyecto clara, ¿vale? Podéis poner ahí, vale, ok, ahí sí, thumbs up, to closes, to nose, I think it's a no in Zoom. Yeah, yeah. So there's a number of X's and there's a few thumbs up. For those of you that are working on this on the Cinderella project, it's wonderful, isn't it? It really is, is great. And that's what the initial concepts of agility, that was where it was kind of the, the sweet spot for it. But we know today our projects don't look like this fairy sprinkling dust. They look much more like this thing. Your project has got stakeholders spread across multiple time zones. They've got distributed teams. You've got conflicting goals. You're working on at least two or three different projects. There's um, <clears throat> different organizational goals if they're even alive if they're even de defined and presented out there and this gives us a completely different environment it just we're not cinderella very very few of our projects today are in the cinderella space they're more the yeah the ugly alien Philippe Christian gave us a model to help think about the, um, the aspects that we should consider when we come up with our approach with, to our way of working. And he says that the, the, he calls it the octopus model because there are eight arms to it. And it, the context for your project is, is all of these things, plus possibly more. There's the size, and, and I don't care what unit of metric we use. We know the difference between a small and a big project. There's the level of criticality. What happens if something goes wrong? Do people die? You know, are we in missile guidance systems? Are we in um, medical, con medical device control systems? Or are we, do people, do we lose half an hour of productive time? Or do we not even notice it if, it if the system goes down or if something is wrong? What's the organization's business model? Are we a bank that uses software or are we a software development company selling banking systems? How stable is the architecture for our product? How distributed is our team? And today we know we've learned to work with remote teams, but how distributed in terms of time zones? What's our governance model? What are our, what's our risk appetite in the organization? What is the rate of change? Some companies live in a, a world where change is incredibly tumultuous and quick. Others, if we, I, I worked on one system that was for agricultural systems, for farm management. Our farmers did not want a new release of the product every two weeks. They didn't even want it every month. 
they when we would when we we shrunk the delivery cycle down from an 18 month cycle and we got down to eventually we were at two weeks and we were told that is too frequent and we actually ended up deploying once a quarter once every three months that was the the rate at which our our farmer customers were comfortable to absorb change the age of the system are we building on a platform that's uh, 30 years old and written at the at its core in COBOL. And they, so the ability to change, there's a huge amount of technical debt in there. Or is this the very, very latest system that's been built using microservices and Kubernetes and all of the most modern tools? So there's a whole lot of things that need to be taken into account when we look at our approach and this has a huge impact on the product ownership approach. Because what product ownership needs to cover is all of these things, marketing, product management, business advocacy, customer advocacy, end user adv advocacy. So we're bringing very different perspectives. We have to, as the product owner, we need to understand the domain subject matter. We need to be good at analysis. We need to be able to build analysis models to simplify complex um, situations and understand them more effectively. We need to understand the elements of user experience and graphic design. We need to be innovators. We need to be good communicators. Oh, by the way, we need to be good at making decisions and we have to understand the legal elements. This is Superwoman. She doesn't exist in the real world today. There's no way that a single human being can have all of these responsibilities for any sort of a complex product. So this is where the concept of the value elements of the team and the delivery elements of the team. So a single product team needs stakeholders, needs people who are focused on delivering product and people who are focused on identifying value. They bring different perspectives. They are the linchpin of the two roles of what Scrum calls the product owner and the scrum master, the, the, value, the value team facilitator and the delivery team facilitator. So those two work incredibly closely and the rest, we treat this as a single team. This is an important thing. I'm not advocating for separate teams. What I am advocating for is different team members having different focus areas and bringing that different perspective. So if I look deeply into the value focused elements, we need that facilitation. This is the hat that Scrum calls the product owner um, that I prefer the term value manager. Their responsibility is to maximize the value that we deliver to the organization. They will do some project management. There needs to be project management competencies in there. There also needs to be governance. And the governance you see behind the, the representative on the, in the circle, there's one voice coming into the circle, but behind that is the whole organization governance model. We may need some user acceptance test, independent verification validation, particularly if we're building products that have to go through an external validation process. We need user experience knowledge. We need somebody who represents the business stakeholders and that may cycle around depending on where in what part of the product we're building at this stage. Uh, I worked on a banking system where for some of the time we had on the team, a teller, some people who were, in fact, we had a group of, of three, three tellers who had come from different branches and they were seconded to this and they gave us the, that perspective. 
But when we were working on the management aspects, we actually seconded into the team of branch manager because they brought us that perspective. So the, the business stakeholders are going to cycle through. We need to have the visionary, the champion. Um, in many traditional organizations, you'll hear this called the project sponsor. But this is the person who really, really cares about why we are doing this thing. And oh, by the way, we need business analysis competencies. So this is the team aspect, the team sport aspect of product ownership. And it's like a soccer team. The value facilitator, the person wearing the product owner hat, is the captain on the team. But they are not making the play-by-play -play decisions. They're setting the guidance. If the ball comes towards me, I don't stop and say, Captain, can I kick it? I see the ball, I kick it. I look, I'm, I'm contextually aware of my other team members. I kick the ball to the place where it is, where I know that that person is going to be able to take it to the goal. So this is the the concept of product ownership as the captaincy on the team, providing the, the broad direction and guidance, but enabling the whole team to make the right contextual decisions in the moment. And then in terms of the delivery side of team of, of things, we've got we need architecture, engineering, analysis, testing. These are the minimum set of competencies. And depending again on the nature of the work, we might bring in, when I say engineering development, that could involve machine learning experts. It could involve um, database, database experts and so forth, data management, big data people, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the competencies that are needed based on the context we work within. So that's my premise of product ownership as a team sport. How, let's, let's jump out. I'll stop sharing. Where's the control bar gone? How does this land? How do people think? It's a question for the audience? Yeah. Ok, chicos. Uh, Shane nos pregunta más o menos cómo esto aterriza en vuestras organizaciones, cómo se aterrizan los conceptos que, que ha presentado, ¿sí? ¿Cómo, cómo lo habéis visto, lo veis muy lejano, lo veis muy real. ¿Cómo lo veis? Un poco podéis hablar por el chat, podéis habilitaros el micro y hablar aquí. Y, 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 y comentar, puede ser en inglés, puede ser en español, como os venga bien. Shane, there's one comment from the chat mm -hmm. that we have. I just said that it's more a Kraken than an alien. It's referring to the, from the Cinderella project to the alien part. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, I want to say that um, what Shane say is completely makes sense. But usually in the organizations, I see that in the projects, only one people is always trying to make all these things. But uh, absolutely makes sense that that must be a, a team work more than only one person. Yeah. yeah. And this means that many organizations are trying to do this in the wrong way. In fact, and maybe. that's my premise. That's my hypothesis. <laughs> that we could be doing it better. But my question is for the for the people that want to be a product mm -hmm. owner, yeah, mm -hmm. and go to an organization and start to drive them uh, participating uh, mm -hmm. as project manager. That means that for the managers, they must say, hey, you must hire 
too many people to do the same role. How communicate this to the manager? How tell that or persuade, pers <laughs> persuade in, in, in Spanish? Yeah, How... I, I'm going to. I'm going to go with you probably don't need to employ too many people. What you need to do is engage people. So if we look at many of those roles, the, many of those hats, they're people that are already in the organization most of the time. But we yeah. need to be able to engage them effectively on in our work. And one of the things that we look for is as much dedicated focus time as possible. Yeah, then you say that the product ownership is not only a role, it's something that is involved all the team. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's, so the the there's the team captain. There's There is the team captain. Okay. And that captaincy can cycle around. Um, the, what they need is a, uh, a leadership perspective of uh, what is often called servant leadership, host leadership, and deep understanding of the, uh, of, of the, the human aspects of collaboration and communication. Uh, I see a, a statement in there, I'm the scrum master and I also have to be the product owner. That is fundamentally so difficult because when we look at those two, the, the conflict There are three comments on the chat. Yeah, uh, there the are company. many. Yeah. yeah, there's some on the Spanish. If, if you mm -hmm. want, you can take the English ones and mm -hmm. then I translate you the Spanish ones. Sure. There are many business owners de demanding to only one product manager to command the prioritization of the team. Yeah, uh, it's that. The, I agree there needs to be a single decision point. So when there is conflict in priority, that's when the hat of that product owner, of that value team facilitator, that's when that comes out. If between the group, we're struggling to agree on priorities, the product owner, the person wearing the product owner hat, they are the final arbiter of priority decisions. That is really, really important. We don't want to get into design by committee. So that what the Scrum Guide talks about, the responsible for prioritizing the value in the backlog, that is a big aspect of the role. But they can't do that in a vacuum. They need to have the understanding from all of those other perspectives in the value team, in the product ownership team, sub team. Okay, there's another one. I consider that they land quite well the concepts. However, the clients do not have a clear way of working. And we find that some IT directors, they change the scope and the time of the delivery. And that makes that the working plan, it's, it has been affected. It, uh, okay, it should be to generate value from the sponsor to the developer. It's more of than an opinion than a question. Mm -hmm. And there's another comment saying that I am the Slam Master, I am also the product owner. Yeah. <laughs> there's somebody Oof. in that part. Yeah. And then there's another in English. There are many business owners demanding the only one product manager that commands the prioritization of the teams and take the control owner, con and take the product owner control over the backlog, mm -hmm. ordering sometimes. And the last comment, in my work, we do not dedicate time to social projects. And we have some difficulties at that level with the, the team. That's why I am learning about these methodologies mm. and try to manage overloads and stress. Mm. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. It's, it's, <laughs> it's more than an opinion than a question that, that's also great. Yeah, yeah, the, 
Agile is about individuals and interactions, creating sustainable humanistic workplaces. That's why I got involved with the Agile movement at all, is, was because I saw the opportunity to move from the mechanistic uh, command and control management style that I was uncomfortable with to a more interactive, adaptive. In 2001, I read Kent Beck's original book on extreme programming. And I, at that time, I was leading programming teams. And we applied these techniques and lo and behold, it worked. And that was, that was enlightening for me. So thank you folks, let's move on. And now I'd like to talk about one of the most common mistakes that I see. The backlog is not a series of stacked plates that we just pull from the top with every item is exactly the same. In my mind, the backlog, the shape of a healthy backlog is a funnel. And think of, uh, I used to do work with um, mining companies and in particular with the mining, uh, diamond mining companies in Southern Africa. And in that space, the, in the kimberlite fields, these are, are volcanic pipes that go deep into the earth. And what they do is they blast these big rocks out of the ground and they put them into an ore crusher and they crush them down to smaller and smaller pieces and they throw most of it away. And what comes out at the bottom are the gems. Your backlog is that pipe of rocks. In there are some gems and diamonds. Further away, you want to have the big chunks, whether we call them epics, whether we call them features, whatever. There's these big chunks of stuff. As we get closer, we break them down and we break them down. We throw away a lot of the concepts because we're learning through this <coughs> evolutionary process what, what the real needs are. And eventually what comes out at the bottom are the gemstones that are gonna make a difference in our product. And this filtering and breaking it down, the crushing of these rocks is an incredibly important responsibility for product ownership as a whole. If you have a backlog that has hundreds or thousands of user stories in it, you have no way of managing and effectively using that backlog. You can't contain it in a single head. And by thinking of it as that time scale, and there's a, a clear understanding of the time scale, you know, today we're at the what we need now. This is the small pieces that have been really well understood. And you'll notice they're a lot smaller and, and if we add the volume at the bottom, there's a lot less than what goes in at the top. Now, we know statistically that around about two thirds of um, features in products are never used. In the typical software product today, the, the one statistic said 68% of the features that we built are never, ever used. They're built because somebody said it would be good if, or that would be a great idea, or while we're doing that, can we do this? But the reality is it's not going to be used. If we can prevent that, those pieces being built, we can immediately cut the time and cost of our projects. We also reduce the technical debt because bugs live in pit bits of the system. So if we can take that filtering and think about, okay, where are we? And the, the time frame, 
you know, wishful thinking. These are the things we would love to have. They're big rocks. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about them. We, we filter those down. We throw some of them away. We break them apart. We get to what do we want someday? Then we filter that down even further. And we might be looking maybe at uh, one quarter or a couple of months worth of time frame, what we want soon. And then what we need now is one or two sprints worth of backlog items refined well enough that we can start working on it. And that's the backlog that goes to the team. So product ownership is doing this filtering funneling work as well working with the stakeholders to discard most of the things that we didn't that we, that we thought we wanted and that's really important the product owner's job is to remove things not to add things because it's about the consistent delivery of value you uh, Hopefully, and most of you are familiar with the concept of the velocity graph. That is the, the almost straight line here. For most teams today, we track velocity using story points, or it might be team hours or whatever. And this is how much work have we done on an iteration or sprint by sprint basis. And it's normally done in story points. What many teams struggle to do is to track value. That's real value delivered to customers. And your value curve is going to have an S shape. Your first couple of sprints are going to deliver not a lot of value, but it's going to be important stuff. There, there's some... Um, foundational things that need to be in there there's the we get to a point where there's an M mvp now this is one of the worst the most misused terms in um software development today is this mvp it's often taken to instead of a minimum viable product it's a minimum really crappy product it's the we don't have time, so we'll call it an MVP, whereas it should be enough to validate your most important assumptions. That's what the MVP is for. And we get to the point where, okay, we've validated the big assumptions. Now we can start delivering and we see the value line curve up quite sharply for a while. And this is when we're doing the most important elements in the backlog and we're, we're refining the backlog and bringing things through. Then we get to a point where we've done the, the things and now the incremental that value that we're delivering is actually harder to see. And one of the most powerful elements of the product owner role is the ability to say, stop. We have done enough to recognize when the value curve is flattening out and say, all of this other stuff that's in the backlog, even though it's still there, it's not going to add more value than it will cost us to build it. So stop it. Stop work and move another backlog into this team. Don't disband the team but move another backlog into this team. One of the criteria, one of, one of my strong suggestions is the concept of stable teams. Don't have a project-based culture where we, we reform the team. We give people just long enough to become an effective team and then we disband them. No, keep stable teams and bring new work to the team. Because by stopping work here, we have saved all of that cost and the value it would have added was trivial knowing when this tipping point happens is a bit of an art and it's the key in my mind this is 
the most important responsibility of the product owner knowing when to stop so this is part of that prioritization and value management so that's what product ownership is the other thing about it is innovation jim highsmith way back in 2007 the number one challenge of agile project management is creating a culture of innovation everything else pales in comparison in this lovely term, agile projects attempt, often attempt to implement the new, the untried, and the nearly impossible. This is not the problem in domain in which controlling tasks to achieve a fixed plan will succeed. This is a problem domain that demands the innovative exploration of, pro of possibilities. That's product ownership, the innovative exploration of possibilities. And really important, just because we're bringing on a new way of working, we're calling it agile. The new, the old techniques that have been valuable, the analysis skills, the functional decomposition, the user experience design, the quality approaches, all of the things that we've known about for a long time, do not go away just because we're doing agile. There's the do not throw the baby out with the bathwater is the English metaphor. Make sure that when you bring forward your way of working, you're bringing the things that do work. And then imagination is more important than knowledge. The product owner needs access to people with creative thinking. Envisage and understand and identify future possibilities that create business growth. Where is your imagination going? So, if I could wrap everything up, the product owner role is good, but it's flawed as it's most often implemented. Project environments are complex and varied. Product ownership needs a team with diverse skills and, and viewpoints. Value is what we're about. A backlog is more and less than a long list of user stories. There's that funnel. And there are tools and techniques which can help. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this has been worthwhile. Questions? OK, thank you, Shane. There's a poll. Uh, OK, funnel. Sí, funnel en español es embudo. Yeah, we already have that translation. Y si tenéis preguntas para Shane, podéis hacerlas en español, podéis hacerlas directas en inglés a él. Vale, os da las gracias, Shane. También. <laughs> okay, let's see if there is any any questions for you, Shane. Thank you, Shane. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, Thank you for the information, really interesting. Okay. Okay, a comment in here to stop when we know that the implement is so small of value can be a risk, mm -hmm. but we can plan to pay the technical debt in the latest sprints. It's more an opinion than a question. But this is this balance mm -hmm. between risk and and, and value. Mm -hmm. I I'd, um, I'd ask, don't build the technical debt in in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah, I am a project leader. 
I am evolving to be an Scrum master, but I used to be, or I have to be a PO. Uh, would you recommend, what would you recommend to continue my PO path? I would like to know from the beginning and do not have any, uh, let's say, the PSS, it could be some overlaps between the roles. So one of the, in my mind, the different differentiator between should you take a product ownership role or should you take a scrum master role? And please don't try and do both. Uh, the scrum master is more focused on technical and product delivery. So if you have a bias towards the, the technology and the implementation and you're comfortable dealing with people at the, with technical people and supporting and engaging technical people to, in, to be more effective in their roles, then the servant leadership aspect of the Scrum Master role is, is really powerful. On the other hand, if you're more comfortable looking outwards at customers, at uh, community, and identifying that that you know, the the innovation, the imagination, if that's where you sit, then the product ownership, but you're still going to be doing a lot of facilitation. So the uh, many of the skills that have traditionally been in the in the space of business analysis, they still need to be there, and that's where product ownership sits. So it, it does come down to what is your personal style and preference? What gives you joy in work? Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Somebody that wants to share or comment? Alguien que quiera compartir, comentar? I have a doubt. Okay. So when you were explaining the, you know, the curves, to recognize where the curves start, started fluttering, mm -hmm. um, there is a limit of value that you can add to the, to the product or, or to the final product. Um, not recognizing this, this flutter can deliver in the downhill or just Ultimately. stay as a, as a, as a flutter forever. Oh. What it does is it, I, I would say it, it, it will actually decrease the value because what we end up doing is building more and more stuff that, don't, that people don't use. Oh, okay, okay, got it. And just, in, just by having that, there's going to be latent defects and bugs lying in there. So you're going to build technical debt into the product as well, which in the future, when you now need to adapt that product to a new set of needs, make it harder to change. So you're going to have more stuff that you don't use for, yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah. And uh, that, that develops in a, that, yeah, that delivers in, a, in, a, in spending more resources, more time, more unnecessary, I don't know, uh, yeah. uh, time where people working, whatever. And that's, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah. okay. And, and you can get to a point where the value curve has become flat line uh, has gone right down to the base where it's a, where actually you're just maintaining this product costs us more than we get from it as an organization yeah this, this was uh, this why it's so important to recognize where what to stop yeah okay that's my doubt. thank you thank you so much okay Let's see. Here you have a comment from the former uh, Scrum Master and PO. Excellent response. Thanks for your pathway and orientation. My pleasure. Um, no sé si queréis preguntar algo más. Algo que queréis que Shane comente. Puede ser en español, puede ser en inglés. Okay, there's you have a Ooh. question in the chat. 
Some tips to avoid the backlog to be a big pile of stories with top priority. What would be the first step to empower the product owner to avoid that? Um, I'm going to, to say there, don't try and do the, the detailed breakdown too early. Deliberately leave the items in the backlog. Think of that funnel, leave the big ones as chunks. Pick which one or two you might break a little bit further down, a little bit further down early on. Now I am going to do a place commercial here and point you towards my book, uh, Hash No Projects. I'll put that into the chat window. Okay, yes, yes, put the book on the chat. Because in, in the book, we do actually talk quite a lot about how to, the shape of a healthy backlog. And it's a free download on InfoQ. And if you, or if you want, you can pay money for it and get a paper copy. Obviously, we prefer you to buy the paper copy because I because we get royalties, but uh, you can also get it for free. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, how you can handle the changes of the increments in the case that the client doesn't feel satisfied is not to end into infinity infinite uh, sprints. How to handle changes, basically. How to handle change? Well, yeah, with a client not satisfied. Engage your clients earlier. Bring them into the sprints. Bring them into, so it's not at the end of every sprint, we go and talk to a client. It's right the way through the work that we're doing, we're engaging the client constantly. So there's, there's no surprises, we're getting feedback. The during the story refinement activities, we're really getting clear understanding. What does this client mean? What do they, what do they need? And, and have them as close as possible. And think about why change is happening. Your customers don't change for the hell of it. They're changing their minds because we've learned, we've all learned something. Either they have learned from their external environment that something has changed, or we as a group have learned that what we thought the customer wanted was wrong. So what are we gonna do to improve that communication and collaboration? The closer we can, tie, we can take this, the better. Is change happens because because something is driving it, go to the cause of that change. Often it is learning. It is the, ah, now that we see this, this is what we understand. This is what we needed. And that's okay. That's good. Then you have any specific technique to decompose the backlog? Yes, and that's a whole nother session. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will, and here I'm going to point you to the IC Agile Learning Outcomes, the product ownership. Uh, Agile product ownership covers a lot of those techniques. So the we have a, at IC Agile, we have a certification in product ownership. And lots of those techniques are listed there, are, are taught in the, in the classes that deliver on that certification. Okay, Shane. Okay. We are running out of time. 
thank so you very thank much. You, thank you very much for having me, folks. Enjoy the rest of the Open Space event. And I'm honored that you invited me to come along. No problem. Thanks. You are welcome. You'll see yeah. you have a lot of people interested in, <laughs> in <laughs> what you say. Okay, thank you very much, Shane. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. Bueno, chicos. Uh, cositas. Voy a parar de grabar porque os voy a decir unas cuantas cosas del evento. Sí.